I also drink my own bath water. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it's so nice to talk to you. And I was looking through my little black book and 10 years ago, virtually to the day I first interviewed you. And in those days, you were still doing more or less what you're doing now, which is selling out theatres and being funny. The only thing that's changed today is that you sat in the jungle for a couple of weeks. Who'd have thought it? I can't believe I'm in your little black book. That's what I can't believe. <laughs> <laughs> you actually looked it up to see how long ago we first interviewed each other then. <laughs> yes, it is a little bit weird, mate. Yeah. It was like going on a really crap holiday and coming back as Elvis for a few weeks. <laughs> you know, obviously it's peak now, and you know Elvis is dead. But um, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's been a quite a bizarre roller coaster past three months, really. Yeah, you've always been different, and that's what I loved about you in the beginning. I mean, we did so many telephone interviews, and right from the beginning, you were so different, and you could make me laugh, and you made our listeners laugh, and you certainly made your live audiences laugh. <laughs> How did you become you? I mean, the voice obviously was the first thing that people noticed about you, but the fact that it's old style variety. Variety comedy. You don't say the F word, you don't swear, you don't do anything outrageous, you're just funny. See, I don't know whether, I don't think there's any such thing as old style variety comedy. I don't think there's no new style, but there's style of funny or not funny, and that's it. I don't mean that in an offensive way, and that's not what I mean. I mean old style in a sense that most of the modern comedians today that I see on the comedy store and programs like that don't make me laugh. You're on medication, though, aren't you? <laughs> you know, I'm trying to dig out of this deep hole knowing that we've got an hour program to do. Oh, no, that's all right, mate. I'm, I'm always in the <laughs> Or I was myself. The thing is, I've always felt, you know, everybody wants to pigeonhole, especially in this business, you want to pigeonhole someone so we know exactly what they are. When you talk about it and you see them, that's who they are. Um, and the fact that people haven't been able to pigeonhole me, I came in at the uh, at the tail end of all the variety stuff when it was all just on the way out, you know, the uh, the last knockings of a Saturday night from the London Palladium, the summertime specials, all that sort of stuff, was just on, on the way out with the new um, comics coming in. So uh, the fact that I'm still here after 20 years, still working, Working, still doing telly, still, um, you know, selling at theatres. Um, they're also a market for CAC. That's what I think it is. <laughs> Why did you choose this style of comedy then? Let's put it that way. Why did you not want to do the political stuff and the ironic humour that so many do now? I just think you actually you don't choose what type of comedy you want to do. The comedy chooses you. You know, you gravitate to what feels natural to you. You know, the, 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 the thing is, when you're up on stage doing comedy, you can't hide who you are up there. Um, the successful ones, you, that's who they are. You know, I, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know Jack D, but I should imagine Jack is, um, that is Jack a lot of the time. You know, I've met Lee, a few to Lee Evans a few times, and that's who Lee is a lot of the time, you know. It's, uh, admittedly, he's not like that all the time. We should get arrested. Same as I'm not, you know, a squeaky voice gone all the time. Most people just think I'm off my head and heavily medicated. So uh, <laughs> I don't think you can hide who you are, You and you, you don't choose a style of comedy that chooses you. Same as the audiences, they decide if you're funny or not. You know, you can think this is great, great material, they'll love this. And if they don't laugh at it, they don't laugh at it. They're the, ultimately, they are the critics, regardless of what anybody puts on paper. Oh, I think this bloke's cack, I think he's great. Ultimately, it comes down to the audience. If they laugh at you, then you're funny. If they don't, then you ain't funny. And that's why one night you can be funny, the next night you might as, you know, be about as funny as a kick in the, kick in the nuts. You can't keep going out on tour for 11 years and expect people, well, we're going to do the same stuff next year, so come back and watch it, it'll be great. They won't do it. So I always say, look, next year it'll still be cack, but it'll be different cack. So, yeah, it's a conscious decision to keep average because I'll get bored. How people do the same stuff over and over again is beyond me because uh, there's no challenge in that. There's a lot of pressure there every year then. No, there's no pressure. I'll tell you what pressure is. People go, oh, I need to take some drugs. I'm in show business. I'm under so much pressure. I need to have a drink. I need to see my psychologist. Well, I don't. You know, I'll tell you what pressure is. Pressure is if you're, if you're a brain surgeon, right, <laughs> trying not to sneeze while you're operating on somebody. That's pressure. <laughs> Imagine you've got a scalper there and you're just doing some operation and you've got a sneeze coming. That's pressure. Show. This ain't pressure, it's just having a laugh. <laughs> Good point. Right, we're going to talk about a lot today. We're going to find out about you and your childhood and how you got started. And you know, something that also dawned on me about you is you've changed massively since we first met. Have you got a personal trainer? What's happening? Yeah, slightly less fat. Uh, I lost a stone and a half in the jungle, but only off my hands, so none of my gloves <laughs> fit me anymore. Uh, even my idiot mittens are just hanging off me like socks. So, um, yeah, I just managed to keep the weight off in the jungle. That really was stone and a half in 18 days. It's a lot, you know. It's like cutting some somebody's head off you know what I mean that's how, that's how easy it is to lose that sort of weight uh, and I just managed to keep it off by not eating food are you now surrounded by a million people telling you how to be Joe Pasquale or are you managing to keep yourself to yourself I'm surrounded by my guinea pigs that's what I am they are my advisors in the real world because <laughs> my great grandfather was a guinea pig 
Uh, no, I don't have any advisors. I don't have none of that. What are you talking about? You no, that's all pants, that is. I don't have anyone advising me. No, no advisors at all. Just, you know, I'm nearly 44 this year. If I need somebody advising me now, I might as well go and work at B&Q. How did it all start then? I mean, you're in your 40s now. Let's go back to your childhood. Were you a funny child? No, I was boring. I was really quiet. Uh, I got two O-levels in uh, metalwork and biology, so all I could do was weld a cat when I was younger. And, uh, <laughs> no, I was quite, quite, very quiet boy. I was, mate. Even I speak to my dad now, he's, oh, no, he's a very nice, quiet, gentle boy. And that's who I was, you know, and something happened when I left school. I don't know what happened, you know. I got run over when I was 13. That might have had something to do with it. And uh, I, was, I was doing the first morning of a paper round and this car hit me and it was hit and ran. It just went off. And I had a chopper bike. Do you remember the chopper bikes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, like, the smaller version was called a chipper. But I had the chopper because it had a great big gear stick on it, right? And it was great. Um, but I got run over. And, uh, and I was all right, right? The car drove off and I was OK. But the bike flew in the air and I was just about to get up and walk away from it and the bike landed on my leg and broke my leg. So I was like, I hated my chopper from that day onwards. <laughs> so you're slightly scared scarred by this yes mentally yeah, and, and physically scarred yeah. it's not really good to say I scarred myself with my chopper <laughs> I can see a fantasy channel series coming on there actually yeah, yeah. Abby Chipman should be in that <laughs> I always think that's such a perfect name to be a porn star what, uh, Abby Chipman yeah or my Mr Chopper <laughs> I think we need to speak to TV execs about that idea. So other than that, I mean, did you go back to the paper round or did you knock it on the head there? No, I knocked it on the head there. That, that was it then. Um, then I always uh, had aspirations of working at a do-it-yourself shop because I'm always amazed that, like, uh, I was go, I was go to do-it-yourself, you know, home-based B&Q and that sort of thing. And a little while ago, I was in B&Q. This is true, this is. And it just uh, occurred to me, I actually saw, right, a butterfly in B&Q. He was actually in the shop. He was around by the way of the wood. You know, they've got all that bits of wood mm-hmm. right up the back of the cement and the wood area, yes. right? Well, there's a butterfly in there, and it amazed me that it was out. I don't know how it got in. It might have crawled in, right, as, uh, as a caterpillar, right, and then turned into a butterfly, right? Can you imagine that? Because butterflies only live for three days, and then that's it. So imagine, because no one was going to let the poor sod out. Imagine if you was a butterfly, spent your whole <laughs> life in B&Q, right, and you go out to butterfly heaven, and the butterfly god and he goes, well, what did you think? He goes, well, it's a do-it-yourself shop. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> You'd think that was what the world was. It was a do-it-yourself shop. What am I supposed to do in there? <laughs> Are we still on the air? <laughs> That's true, though, isn't it? These thoughts that come into your head, then, do they just happen? Do you have to think about them, or are you just always thinking like this? Um, no, it's synatogen that helps. <laughs> and, uh Tizer. <laughs> I don't, see, I don't know. I just talk about me. It doesn't matter. Look, what you, you realise is, is nothing. Life is different for everybody. You know, there's a bloke. Um, there's a story about a bloke that actually gave up work and uh, he sold his house to finance himself so he could actually go to the Himalayas, climb up the Himalayas, go and see the Dalai Lama and find out what the meaning of life was. And he climbed up there and, and he said, "Listen, Dalai Lama, I've packed up work. I've sold my house. I've got no possessions at all. I want you to tell me now what is the meaning of life." And he looked at him. He went, "Life is a bowl of cherries." He went, thank you. And he went home, right? And he saw his mate down the pub. He went, where have you been for the past seven years? He went, I gave up work. I sold my house and I sold everything. I went to see the Dalai Lama. I said, what for? He said, well, I asked him what the meaning of life was. He said, what did he say? He said it was a bowl of cherries. I can't believe that. I'm going to do the same then. So he packed up work, sold his house, sold his possessions, spent seven years getting to the, to the Himalayas, right? And he goes up and said, uh, oh, Dalai Lama, please, I've given up all my bodily possessions and I need you to tell me now what is the meaning of life. He said, life is a bowl of chocolates. And he went, but you told my mate it was a bowl of cherries. He went, did I? He went, yeah. He went, well, perhaps it is. Who were the people who you looked up to as a child and thought, they're funny? Um, when I was really little, it was uh, Dick Emery. I used to love the Dick Emery show, uh, Malcolm Wise. And what's great now, I've just had a job come in. I'm doing um, a few weeks on uh, on the play what I wrote, you know, the uh, with the two two lads. So I'm really looking forward to doing that. i uh, start next week, in actual fact, in Windsor. Um, and uh, Steve Martin in my uh, teenage year, I suppose in my late teenage 20s and all that sort of stuff, Steve Martin, when he was doing stand-up, before he moved into movies, his stand-up was just um, was just so different to anything else that anybody else was doing at the time. So uh, obviously Tommy Cooper, Normal Wisdom, uh, Ken Dodd. Um, Ken was great to me. When I, done, I did new faces in 1987. In the afternoon, I remember that they, the panel actually watch the show in the afternoon, write their comments down so they know exactly what they're going to see, what they're going to talk about in the night time. And Ken was there. And uh, there was Ken, Nina Mishkov and Lindsay DePaul on the heat that I'd done. 
and uh, I did the spot and then went to makeup. And Ken came in and sat down next to me, had his makeup done at the same time. Oh, well, it's Ken Dodd there, it's Ken Dodd, it's a living legend. And uh, he said, Oh, it's very good this afternoon, son, can I give you some advice? So I said, Yeah. And he bought this pa- paper, he had his paper in his pocket and he got it out and he'd written down my whole act that I'd done that afternoon. He rewrote the whole thing. Don't start with that one. Do this. That's, that's an old joke. Don't get rid of that. Do that there. When you get the rabbit out of the hat, don't throw it away. Shove it down your trousers. Shake out the bottom of your leg. Extra laugh there. When you do this, wait there because there's another hidden laugh there. You won't expect this. But trust me, if you wait long enough, you'll get another laugh there. When you do that, throw that out. Do this trick instead. And he rewrote the whole act. And, uh, and I won the heat. Uh, thanks to Ken. What is great about you, though, is the fact that you were prepared to listen. So many people would have gone, no, no, I know what I'm doing. Uh, To be honest, I don't know what I'm doing now. Uh, You've always got to listen, especially to someone like Ken. Doug Ken's a genius, he is. The people that uh, I've learned from, still learning from, you know, one of... uh, 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 one of the great teachers for me as well was, was Bob Monkhouse who sadly went last year um, you know th- these these people that they know they've done it all their lives they've spent their life holding this craft you know uh, Bob was forever ever changing his material all the time constantly right up to the last he was writing new stuff um, it was amazing inspiration was Bob uh, to me and to not just me but a whole generation all, all comics nowadays like you know Bob was amazing he was I got to know Ken Dog quite well in the last few years and he rates you as one of the funniest people in this country now. And Ken doesn't like a lot of people in comedy. That must be a great honour and a thrill for you to have someone as popular and as successful as him thinking that about you because that must mean that when you're as old as he is in your 120s that you'll still be gigging and gagging it's a great compliment coming from ken um he he stopped me smoking as well whenever i start, saw ken he'd uh, he'd pat me down like he was a customs officer and he'd get me fags you're not still smoking these bloody things are you i kill you and uh, and every time i used to think oh god when i knew i was going to see ken like you know i must have my fags on me and eventually you know he just took me into it and i i, I stopped because of ken just getting on at me about it all the time really yeah he is amazing bloke. I've got no idea how old Ken is. Um, His hair, I don't know, his hair must be 200 years old. But I don't know how he does that with his hair. It's amazing. It's like... It's like a great big tuft of grass when you're playing <laughs> golf. It just lifts off, right? If he's a... I don't know. You know, he could go para, paragliding. He could. Get a little rope on him. That air, that get a bit of wind behind it. It'd take off. Uh, yeah, it is great. And I don't know how to react to that, really, from, from Ken Dodd saying that about me. I'm over the moon. I want to talk to you now about the beginnings of your comedy and whether you observe funny things as a child or did it come much later than that when you started being funny for the first time? I think uh, a lot of uh, your personality is decided on um, the position you're born in. I don't mean the position, you know, like upside down. What I mean... <laughs> <laughs> you see, I, I always knew I was going to get into magic, though, because when I was born, I came out of the woman opposite to my mum. So, <laughs> that was a little bit strange. <laughs> it's going to be a long hour, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Um, funny is objective. You know, what some people, what other people find funny, other people don't find funny. Some people found Tommy Cooper hilarious, other people didn't, you know. So, it's only funny to the individual, you know. One day you might be funny, the next day you might, you know, have a cold and not be funny. So, it's really an ongoing thing that you're constantly learning, constantly trying to, to you know, to be funny on, on it, really. But, isn't it? It's just one of those things that um, I don't take too seriously. You know, you just have a laugh. As long as I'm enjoying myself, that's all that matters. You can't expect anybody else to uh, enjoy it if I'm not. You know, if it was a bit of a chore, I don't think I'd want to do it. You know, I'd rather go back to B and Q. I've got great admiration for any comedian because I think it's the most dangerous job in entertainment because you're putting yourself in front of people that can literally boo you off and that's so personal. It's not about the lighting, the set or anything. It's about you and how funny you are on the day. How did you learn to cope with that? Because I know you started in the holiday camps and that must be a good place to learn. Yeah, it is. I think um, the whole thing is is experience. That's all it is. You can say, you know, uh, early early days for me. You know, you still get heckled now, but you just have it. You know, I think so many things have happened in the past 20 years I've been doing it, that any time a situation comes up, I've had it before. There isn't a lot that, you know, I've had people actually die in the audience, you know, and the curtains, you know, they put, put a sheet over them. And I actually had somebody die while I was singing on a song that get on your nerves. You know, imagine them going up to heaven and say, what happened while I was watching Joe Pasquale? I just had enough. Um... <laughs> I had a bloke in Wales once throw his crutches at me. Uh, he was at the bar and he said, I'd rather fall over than listen to this crap. And he threw his crutches at me and fell over. So, uh, you know, I've had people um, literally throw stuff. You know, whatever. So whatever happens, if you've had an experience of it, when it happens, you go, well, that's what happened last time. You deal with it in such a way. 
but every heckle is completely different. You know, you just have to go with it, and that's that's the uh, that's the fun of it. It's flying by the seat of your pants. And often the interesting thing from observing a lot of comedy is that they can get bigger laughs, your retort or things that happen that aren't in the script. Absolutely. They get bigger laughs than the gags. Yeah, that's what. The, but that is the fun of it. that is um, that's the danger. If it was safe, I don't think I'd want to do it. If it was safe, I'd go back to working at Smithfield's Meat Market. You've done some interesting jobs, as yeah. you say. You did the meat market, then you worked for the Department of Transport. What did you do there? I was the uh, I was a civil servant. I was the clerical assistant in the Department <laughs> of Transport and Environment, Dangerous Goods Branch. But all I did was uh, make the tea and filing. So the most danger I got was like getting a paper cut or scolding myself on a kettle. Were you ever going to take this up as a career? Was it ever going to be a lifelong ambition to work for the uh, Department of Transport and Environment? Uh, I wanted to be a spy. That's what I wanted to be. You've got the glasses. I've got the glasses, yeah, but I, you've got little mirrors in the back there. But the thing is, with a spy, you know, people would just remember you too well, wouldn't they? That's, that's Queaky Voice Gong. You know what I mean? So since, since then, I want to be a bad in a James Bond film. That's what I want to do now. I'll be like Noddy with an headache. It'd be great. <laughs> Talking about your voice, has it come down a bit since I first met you? You seem to have brought it down slightly, or is this just age and cigarettes? I think it's probably um, just uh, the time of the day. And uh, as the day goes on, you know... It, <laughs> I get higher and higher. Yeah, it does, you know. And then only dogs can hear me at the end of the day. So, no, to be honest, this is the way I talk generally. You know, when I'm working, it, it tends to go up a little bit because uh, the uh, adrenaline and whatever. You get excited, oh, you just start going into one. But um, at the moment, yeah, I'm just having quite relaxed time with you with uh, sitting there looking at your nasal hair. I'm not one of those guys that spends hours in the bathroom in the morning. Unlike no. yourself, it seems now, you are more better dressed than I remember you. Uh, the reason I've, I'm better dressed is because I've just had photos done this uh, morning. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I don't normally wear this out. This is just because I've just been having pictures done this morning. I wondered yeah. if you'd had one of those gay makeovers or something. I've just done a film this weekend uh, and uh, I played a gay lieutenant in the army, so that was great. Yeah. Well, I would say typecasting. I mean, you know, very well, very well done. Yeah, well, it's, it's good for me, isn't it? Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, can you remember a line from that? Was there any anything that you remember or have you just put it behind you now? No, what? Well, well, leave it. <laughs> leave it. Let's just uh, move on from there. Uh, I can't believe you're talking about that. <laughs> and the hairdo, is it gel or is this just naturally? I mean, and, you know, is this styled your hair? No, it's just literally... <laughs> You're winding me up there, I know you are. <laughs> All I do is, uh, my son does tells me what to do with my hair because he's nearly 17. He says, Dad, don't do that. Just get a bit of gel and rub it in your hand and leave it. And so that's all I do now. All right, OK, we'll move on from fashion and, and your personal appearance. Yeah. Uh, so you did all these jobs and then you worked for Ford and you worked on a building site for a, yeah. a small time. Did you know when you were doing these jobs that it just wasn't for you doing the nine till five? Because that's often the case, certainly for me. I can't have a boss anymore. I, I just can't be bothered. I knew from a very young age that I, that, um, I wasn't going to be doing uh, a normal job as such. Even though I was doing the normal jobs, I knew it wasn't for me. I hated all of them. Um, uh, you know, I wanted to be a copper at one point, but uh, at the same time, I got offered a load of bent gear. So um, yeah, I thought, do I become a copper? Do I accept the bent gear? When I say bent gear, it was just like bananas and boomerangs. Uh, sort of <laughs> but I did, They're coming uh, back, aren't they, boomerangs? Well, leave it, leave it. And uh, I, I did, seriously, I, was, I did contemplate being a copper. And I thought, no, that's not going to work for me. You know, you imagine all these you know, problems that you get. You imagine all these gangsters hold up in a warehouse. Oh, but they would have pesties. They would have pesties in their hands, so they'd be called ginsters. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but, you know, imagine me outside with my megaphone going, come out with your hands up, there'll be trouble. <laughs> Just wouldn't listen to me, would they? I don't think that would have gone down very well. So yeah. when was the first day, then, that you became a professional entertainer, or tried to be? Oh, the first day, I no, tried to be, and being as completely different, you know, <laughs> like 28 years difference in that. Um, I don't really know. I, I just, you just drift into it, you know. I started, uh, getting uh, going at the stage newspaper was the first foray into it and then I saw talent shows oh I could go and do something there didn't have an act or nothing just went and mucked about and uh, I always used to come last and that was where I first <laughs> met Bradley Walsh <laughs> and, uh, and me and Brad you know, we still speak to each other now a couple of times a week after 23 years and uh, he used to win and I used to come last uh, the first one we done was in Enfield it was and uh, and I remember him having a ventriloquist. We were talking about this last week as it happens. He had a ventriloquist puppet of Prince Charles uh, with a flipper on and a snorkel. Uh, uh, just one flipper he had on one leg and a snorkel, and he only had one end. Right? Uh, and he had a little, little diving mask, and it was when the Mary Rose was coming up. And I remember him doing a whole routine about having Prince Charles, because Brad's a great impressionist. A lot of people don't know he does great impressions. Uh, good singing voice, all that sort of stuff. People don't realise, you know... Uh, 
how good he is at all sorts of stuff. It's very adaptable. Um, and then, you know, we stayed mates and we just drifted about together, really, for the past 23 years. It seems to have been in some sort of parallel universe there. In which case, then, do you have any aspirations to end up in Coronation Street, EastEnders or Emmerdale? I don't fancy doing a soap, no. I, I like doing the plays that I've done. I've done a few plays. I've, so I've got someone doing next week. Um, and I enjoyed doing this film over the weekend. I, I quite enjoyed the, uh, the the process. You know, even though I only know what my bit was like, I didn't know what the rest of it was like. Um, it's like a giant jigsaw. I shall dent the editor at the end of the day whether it's any good or not. Um, I just wanted to do diverse stuff. I don't fancy it's been you know six months in a soap because uh, I know it's nine to five that sort of stuff. You know, I know Brad works you know Monday Friday mm-hmm. nine to five sometimes later or whatever. Um, that'd be too much like a normal job for me. You're always going to be a comedian, are you? Because you, you've done plays, you've toured, you've done the live show, obviously, for years and years and years, but you seem to be getting more and more different stuff now. Are you just enjoying that right now, and then you'll come back to the comedy or hopefully just continue to do everything? No, that's what I will do, is continue to do everything, because everything's happening at the same time. You know, I've got this, uh, uh, this play next week. At the same time, we're doing more television and in the process of discussing what we're going to do telly-wise. We start touring again in September. I've got Panto booked in December. So all the time, I'd like being able to do all the stuff all the time I don't want to pack up doing stand up I don't want to pack up doing the acting I don't want to pack up doing any of it I just want to be able to it starts me getting bored I've got a real short attention span do but, you deliberately try and make sure that you're nice no the people that, that I have upset I've always killed straight afterwards <laughs> so they, they're no longer living so uh, no seriously I have I have spent, I have different ways of, uh, of killing them oh uh, really all different yeah. tactics yeah um, this probably won't get aired because you're <laughs> <laughs> you won't believe in this room anyway. No, it probably won't get aired because I'll probably be fired before they have chance no, to put it out. You'll be dead before then. <laughs> You're not going to get me on this nice sofa, are you? Yes, I'm going to strangle you <laughs> with your own nasal hair. You do have a lot of hair at your nose. Thank you very much. Is, is it in it or on it or round no, it or what no, is it? It's actually on the top of your nose, not the actual nasal hair. But you it's see, I haven't had your gay makeover where I would have had a man plucking them. Well, I didn't, to be honest, I immacked my nose before <laughs> I came out. You see, two years ago, you would never have had this conversation with me. You would never have even noticed such a thing. Ah, uh, yes, but I have x-ray vision now. What is better for you, staying in one venue and doing a summer season or touring and doing a different theatre every night? Um, that, there's, there's pros and cons on both of that. You know, if you're stuck in one place, you get bored with the same place all the time. But um, on the other hand, uh, it is a bit of a hassle getting from A to B up and down the country, stopping at uh, places, having the early start off a breakfast every day, gets up your nose, because, you, um, you know, so the little chefs aren't consistent. Some are great, some aren't. I'm not saying which ones are and which ones aren't, but you go an early start of some place, they'll give you an extra bit of bacon, don't charge a 30p for it. Other places, you know, you're like that, what is it, you an extra bit of bacon, that's not a 30p for the bacon. I, well, I didn't ask for it, you just gave it to me. So, um, you know, and also those griddled eggs, sometimes they're... Just if they haven't cleaned the griddle, it can be nasty, can't it? Nasty as you like. <laughs> How do you get over the repetition of the gags thing? Do you still find every gag you do funny when you do it live every night, or is it just an act? Um, no, what I do every night, to keep it fresh, I do have uh, a skeleton, which I, which I have, and then I go off on tangents and come back to it, so it's never boring, you know, the, the heart of it is there, but you go off and see what happens, you know, one night you might talk about your tortoise for ten minutes, <laughs> you know, because I've got a great tortoise, um, her name's Flair, uh, in actual fact, this is true, this is absolutely true. Uh, we, she was ill and a friend of mine is a, a wardrobe mistress of television and she's got a tortoise and our tortoise we don't know how old she was thinking it was a, um, a she it's not it's a he we found out only after we'd given a flair to this lady to Marcia to look after she phoned me up about eight or about eight months ago and said uh, she was in tears and a fox had got hold of her got hold of her she's absolutely true this is and um, but the vet bills were quite high and uh, and she'd looked after so I, I paid the vet bills for it and she had the back leg chewed off so they, in all seriousness it's absolutely true and they put a wheel on the, on the back leg she's got a little wheel on the back of her shell now so she gets about so um, I don't even know what the question was, but um, I, I don't know. It's just so fat. We're talking about we talk, That's how that came about. Uh, because I do, uh, you know, I love animals generally. You know, I've got a pet pig. Uh, he's the only pig that can say his own name because his name is. <laughs> <laughs> so, and camels as well. I haven't got any camels. Used to, but uh, we had to um, get a huge cat flap for it. So uh, <laughs> we haven't got that anymore. We sent him back. 
<laughs> How would you know when a joke is funny? Do you have to try it out on your family first? Do you do it to your audience? How do you know when you're being funny and when you're not? The audience tell you if it's funny or not. As simple as that. I don't try it out my family because my family, you know, they're not, it's my job. You know, Dad, don't bring your work home. So uh, I don't, you know, they'd rather watch um, The Street with Bradley in it rather than watch me. So, uh, no, the audience tell you. Sometimes you think, right, that should be great. That's a great bit, that. You go and do it and they don't laugh at that bit. They laugh at the bit after it. You know, like, oh, I thought that was a funny bit. Once again, it's the audience that decide what's funny and when you're funny, not, not me. It's them. The great thing about your show is it's kind of ad lib. If you get annoyed with the audience, you'll show that, won't yeah. you? I mean, a lot of performers won't show any emotion. I know it's part of the act, but that's great that you kind of go, well, if you're not going to laugh, I'll do something else. Yeah, I think you have to be honest with them because they can see through it. If you go out and try, if I go out there in particular and, and so I'm be somebody I'm not trying to work like I'm not, not who I am, they'll, they'll see through it and that's it. I think the honesty of it comes through, you know. You don't show 100% of yourself because you get arrested, but... I think you do it after show enough of yourself, to, you know, your vulnerability, whatever it is, and show, look, I, honestly, I say to them, look, I know there's certain people here that don't want to be here tonight, some of you are only here because somebody else wanted to come and they didn't want to be on their own. And you're in there sitting there going, oh, God, I've got to sit for two hours of this cake. Why have you brought me here? <laughs> and if you open it up to them and say, look, I understand you're not going to like this. This isn't your cup of tea. You might prefer to, you know, go to the pictures. You might prefer going down playing snooker. But you've got to sit in there. You've paid your 15 quid and that's it. So like it or lump it. And if you're honest with them about it, you know, there's nothing Nothing can harm you then. You know, if you if you take down all the barriers and go, look, this is what it is. I know it's cack. It don't matter, though, does it? You know, life's too short. I want to talk about another one of your friends that I did an hour special with last year, Wayne Dobson. Now, magic, I know, is a huge part of your life. You had Wayne as your warm-up, uh, but he has multiple sclerosis. And you've really, really championed his cause and continued to defend him and put him on stage. And I think you're the only one that's done that. And he was so grateful. To be honest... The reason I used him was because he's a great act. That's why I used him. You know, it wasn't because, oh, let's champion this cause. It wasn't that. Wayne is a fantastic magician. He's a, a real lovable bloke as well, on stage and off. But I used him because he's a sensational act. And audiences still want to see him work. You know, that, as you said, a lot of people don't know about his disability now. And uh, I'm sorry we brought it out in the open a little bit. But that wasn't, a, a, I wasn't trying to champion the cause of MS sufferers. It was because it was a such a shame that he's got such a talent and it, it was being wasted just sitting there um, he's uh, tutored my son over the past few years I've known Wayne for a long time now and he's tutored my son in the business and then goes to drama school and he's a, a, a brilliant magician my son he's going to LA in, in July doing the magic cast like Wayne got him all of that sorted out um, he's actually giving something back to the, the magic business Wayne you know he's giving something to to everybody anybody that sees him work now he's an inspiration because uh, you know I don't think I would would have keep going if I if I was in the position he was in. But he, not only does he want to keep going, um, he does keep going, and he's still fantastic. You saw him yourself. He's just an amazing bloke. Uh, that's still got a lot to offer, and I think it's a shame that the public uh, miss out on it. So that's why I got him back out on the road. It really was one of the most inspiring interviews I've ever done because you always in this business think that your problems are more important than everybody else's. But when you see someone like Wayne and you see what he has to go through to just get on stage yeah. and then he's still hysterical. I mean, that's the, as you said earlier, that's the main point yeah. that the guy is still as funny as he ever was. Yeah, he's amazing. Yeah, and he's a, uh, I see, I remember him before, before I even came into the business, I used to watch him on the telly and he's, you know, when he was just breaking through, I remember all the Royal Variety shows that he'd done and, and the telly shows, everything that he'd done uh, and the live stuff is, is you know, as a, as a live art act, he, there's no one to touch him, you know, and he's still got that that uh, that desire inside to to perform, you know, and that will never leave him ever. Well, thank you again for giving him the chance, and thank you for bringing him back to us because I don't think we would have had the chance to see him again if you hadn't have done that. No, I agree. I think it's a, uh, you know it is a, a talent that he's got that a God given talent that that shouldn't just sit there and waste away. Uh, and he's still out doing stuff now. He still works the uh, the circuit. He still does um, uh, all the magic conventions and all of that, and uh, the magic clubs. Uh, I just wish that he could get out and do some more theatre work as well. Let's move on now in our remaining moments to talk about the thing that's really propelled you into mega stardom. Is the skill with a program like I'm a Celebrity just keeping your mouth shut, just sitting there and having a wry smile to the camera? Because that's really what you did, didn't you? You didn't get involved in any of the politics because that's dangerous because they can then edit that and make you look in a certain way. Well, to be honest, I think the danger is not being yourself. That's what it is. I don't think you can have a game plan. All you can do is be yourself. 
myself, you know. Uh, my son said to me, Dad, whatever you do, uh, don't don't swear, don't lose your temper, don't scratch your nuts and don't fart. And that was my four rules. <laughs> that was it. The rest of it was all me. Because I, I do all of those things, you know, I lose my temper. It's not a bad temper, you know, as you'll find out when I try and kill you later. Uh, I do scratch my nuts, I do uh, blow off. Um, but... That was the things. I think the danger is not being yourself. Because if I went in there and I wasn't myself and I got kicked out early, I would have kicked myself for not being myself. And so the whole thing is, if you if I got kicked out early, at least I could actually say, well, I've got me dignity, that's all I am. At this point, was it a good experience? I know professionally speaking it was, but actually in terms of just wasting two weeks of your life in a jungle and getting eaten alive by the bugs, was it a good experience? Uh, it was. It was a very positive experience. Uh, the, the challenges that I got, the trials, were fantastic. You know, I jumped out of an aeroplane. I've never done that and would never have thought about it. You know, well, you know, there's a bloke strapped to your back there. Jump out of that plane. All right, then. Uh, okay, now what we're going to do is hang out this helicopter that's doing 40 miles an hour and you're going to have a 200 mile an hour down draft pushing you down over the sea in Australia. There's a whale in the water below you and you've got 200 metres down a rope ladder and fill these flags. All right then. Okay, now you've got to sit in this coffin uh, covered in water with 40 rats doing a number two on your head. Is that all right? Yeah, that's fine. All of these things that, that are put in front of you like that, the, you know, you're like, I don't know if I can do any of this stuff. Can I do that? And you find out, you know, I can do that sort of thing. But you can do anything. Anyone can do anything if you put your mind to it. So it was just mind over matter. You didn't consider the danger of it. You just did it. Was that a TV pressure or was it just for yourself to say you'd done it and you didn't give in and say no? No, it's me. It's just me because I'll do whatever's put in front of me. Can you go and do that? I don't know. I'll have a bash. If I can do it, I will. If I can't, I won't. It's all a learning experience. That's what I mean. Life's a bowl of cherries. Is it a bowl of chocolate? You don't know. <laughs> well, congratulations on everything. You've just come out of this brilliantly. And not everybody does with reality TV. And I think, again, it's just because you're the guy you are and you didn't try and put on an act. And you didn't go in there telling gags every two minutes because I think that would have annoyed people. And people just wanted to know you, not your act. That's my job. Uh, you know, I didn't, they didn't book me to go out and do my job. You know, same as um, Fran Cosgrave, who was a great bloke. Fran didn't go out there and open up a nightclub. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Um, Janet Street Porter didn't, uh, you know, uh, do a critique on everything. Um, oh, I don't know about that. Well, I don't know about <laughs> that, but you know what I mean? They, they didn't employ me out there to go and do what my job was, you know. Um, even, you know, I don't know. So I just went out there to be myself.